Hey, hi, it's uh, Janet Fitch, and this is a live um, uh, virtual book club uh, session uh, on my novel, The Revolution of Marina M., uh, which came out in, um, came out in uh, uh, 2017, exactly a um, hundred years to the day uh, of the outbreak of the October Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Hundred hundredth anniversary, I don't think they celebrate it in Russia. Hi, Alyssa. So this is... Uh, um, Marina M. and I'm doing this virtual, hi Christy, doing this virtual book club because next week my, the second part of the story, the second book, the conclusion comes out uh, next, uh, this coming week, Chimes of a Lost Cathedral. So I thought people would like to get up, back up to speed if they, if it's been a while since they've read Marina M. And um, get ready for the new book. So I am ready to take questions. I'm ready to talk about Russia. I'm ready to talk about uh, the poster behind me, which plays a big part in. Uh, hi, uh, the poster behind me plays. Hey, Peggy, plays a big part in book number two. Uh, and I'll give you a look at this poster, and what it says is is. Um, is the Kronstadt card is covered. And that is part of Chimes of the Lost Cathedral. So you saw it here first. So taking questions, or I can begin with um, some comments of my own. Hi, Loretta, you made it. Very cool. Oh, so good to see you guys. Um, so my first a thought is I could talk a little bit about, um, uh, hi, Toby. Hey, Tina. Hey, I'm so excited to see you here. It's, I feel like Sheriff John, which was a local cartoon host when I was a kid and he had a magic mirror and he saw everybody, uh, in the TV audience. <laughs> um, oh, I thought the first, uh, we could talk for a moment. One of the questions that I'm asked a lot, um, about and I thought I could put that in there while you guys are assembling your questions um, is people uh, asked me um, why do uh, why do Russians have three names it always is a hang up for Americans uh, reading Russian literature why do they have three names so that's a that's a actually a pretty simple one hi Elizabeth um, hi Valerie so it's like, why do Russians have three names? Um, because your middle name, you know, you'll na your name, like Marina's name is Marina Dmitrievna Makarova. So her, that middle name, Dmitrievna, is her father's name, Dmitri. So everybody gets that father name. It's called a patronymic, and you don't, who cares? Nobody's going to have an exam on this. Uh, but everybody has a middle, that middle name is their father's name. And then it's Evna if it's a woman, it's Ovich if it's a man. So Dmitri Evna, daughter of Dmitri, because back in the olden days when you were in the village, you didn't need a last name. People didn't have last names. You were Olga Dmitri's daughter as opposed to Olga Ivan's daughter. And nobody cared about your last name. They didn't have it. Uh, so last names started to be place names. So, you know, uh, so-and-so, Ivan's daughter from Kirov or whatever. Um, and uh, women's names end with A, ah, so Kirova would be, or Makarova is Marina's last name because her father is Makarov. Uh, her brothers are Makarov, but she is Makarova. So it's very easy if you're watching a movie and there's uh, uh, the credits roll and you're wondering if people, women or men, are the cinematographer or whoever. You look for the last name. If it's an ah, it's a woman. Um, so very simple. So that's the first one. Now, when Russians have are being respectful 
to some older person where we would say Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones. Um, Russians use that first name and that middle name, the patronymic. So the polite thing, say um, Marina's mother is a very uh, elegant woman. And so people refer to her as Vera Borisovna, not Mrs. Makarova, but Vera Borisovna, first name and that patronymic. That's uh, an item of respect. To purposely leave it off, um, we, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we no spoilers in here, but when, when Varvara call uh, Marina's friend Varvara, who is a very uh, radical and uh, provocative uh, girl, calls Marina's um, uh, very proper father, Dmitri, rather than Dmitri Ivanovich, um, she is dissing him, like calling him, you know, it's like calling a, an elegant person, you know, Tommy, you know, not Tommy to you. Um, which leads to the second question, you know, um, which is, why do Russians have so dang many nicknames? I tried very hard in this book, um, knowing that by and large, Americans would be the readership, uh, not to, to change people's names too much, not to use their proper name and the nickname and the little bitty nickname. And, but certain characters are more likely to use it. Um, so everybody has these nicknames. They're called diminutives, just means making little, right? Uh, everybody has these nicknames. So Ivan becomes Vanya, N Nikolai becomes Kolya, um, Gennady, Genya, uh, or Genya, I used Genya, um, Sergei becomes Seryozha, um, Alexandra becomes Sasha. And these are pretty standard, but I try not to, we have a Sasha in there, he's a painter, as you know, and we don't use Alexander for him because it would be too dang confusing. So I try very, you know, try not to call Marina's brother Sergei very often because we know him as Seryozha. People use the proper name when they're being sharp with someone, you know, a kid. If they, if a kid gets Ivan instead of Vanya, that's the parent going, you know, you. Um, and a dominion, you know, to get the father name too for a little kid, that's like, you're really in trouble. <laughs> um, there is, uh, then, the, but there's more, even more diminutives. And I have a character who is uh, the, the nanny, uh, 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 if you've been watching or uh, reading, the nanny of Dokia, who was Vera Borisovna's nanny, so she's extremely old. Now she's the nanny of all the Makarov kids. Um, she calls everybody by these long nicknames. And what happens in Russian is the more baby talk it is, the more affectionate it is, the longer it gets. So they have Ushkas and Enkas. So Siryozhenka is the, you know, sweetie darling cutie name that a nanny would call a little kid, Siryozhenka. Merinushka is what she calls Marina. And nobody else does. Only she does. I try to be really, really clear with this. And one of the wonderful things about uh, Chimes of Lost Cathedral, the one coming out next week, is that I actually have a cast of characters with their names. So you can, uh, you know, double check. You don't have to completely reread the book. Hey, hi Sherry. Hi Sayward. We're doing it. Um, so that's why Russians have three names and that's the secret of the nickname. Um, so you can see the relationship between people. If they use the first name and patronymic, you know that's a formal relationship. If they use the nickname, that's an affectionate relationship. If they use the long nickname, that's like Gucci, Gucci, Gucci. You know, that's that's a family, an old family friend. Another question, just to start us off here, while you're thinking of your own questions, um, people ask me, um, why is it called the February Revolution when it started in March? 
And why is it called October, the October Revolution, when it happened in November? Okay, this is a, you know, this is going to apply to all of Russian literature, so might as well conquer this one right now. Uh, you can always blame history for anything that's weird. So history, the weird thing here is that Russians calendar, Russia's calendar was the Julian calendar set up by Julius Caesar uh, at the beginning of the Roman Empire. So that we're talking about a long, long, long time. Then in 1582, I happen to have the info here, the West replaced it with the more accurate Gregorian calendar. But the Russian Orthodox Church, which ruled Russia for, like, was the dominant influence in Russian culture for 700 years. I mean, their Middle Ages was most of their, most of their history. Uh, they stuck to the tradition. So it was only in 1918 that the Bolsheviks converted to the Gregorian calendar and brought Russia up two weeks. So it lined up with the West, the rest of the world, uh, as well at least the West. Um, so that's why the October Revolution began on October 25th, old style. But it's November 7th in the Gregorian calendar. That's So that's why the October Revolution is in November. And the February Re Revolution started on February 23rd, old style. So even though it's in March. So what I did as a writer, as a historic, writing, writing historical, is figuring out what, how is it going to handle the dates. Well, I figured the characters in my book had no idea that there was going to be a new style, right? So I kept to the old style until my characters would have called it new style. And I did the same thing with street names that changed. I kept them to the old street names until they would have been changed and accepted because they renamed everything, but not everybody. Most people didn't. They thought, well, that's kind of weird. It's like renaming a park. It's like, yeah, my parents, you know, we have um, uh, MacArthur Park here in L.A., and uh, my mother grew up here, and she still called it Westlake Park, because to her, that is a whole cultural thing. You know, I'm not necessarily going to change it just because of General MacArthur. Screw him. <laughs> so there's this bridge, if you, the Chernyshevsky Bridge, which uh, figures in many different parts of the book, and also in Chimes of Lost Cathedral. This is a a bridge over the Fontanka near Theater Street, Children of Theater Street. Um, she has a wonderful chapter on this bridge with uh, after the war, uh, or when the when it looked like the Germans were going to take Pe Petrograd. She goes out onto this bridge in the frost with Genya, and Genya decides that he's going to go to the front, um, and they get married, right? So this is the bridge. Now this is called the Chernyshevsky Bridge. It's now called the Lomonosov Bridge, but it wouldn't have been called that in those days. So I stick to the names that people called things at the time. So for instance, I have a street of Tserskaya uh, where Bloch lived, uh, and that figures in Chimes of Lost Cathedral, the poet Bloch. Um, well, it was renamed Decemberist Street after the revolution, but I believe that my characters would still call it Ovitserskaya. So there, there you go. Hey, Kathleen Ellen. Well, I would, I'm opening this up to your questions. So ask me anything. Eric, hey, here's a question about the playing card poster behind you. The Cyrillic is not great, particularly in reverse, but it looks like it's from Kronstadt. Yes, exactly. Um, is What's the significance of the poster? And uh, the sub-question, is it original? Uh, no, it is not an original. This is a, a replica. And what it is, this is part of the second book. This is part of Chimes of a Lost Cathedral. And it says, uh, Kronstadtskaya Karta Bita. 
and it means the Kronstadt card is covered, which is a chapter in Chimes of Lost Cathedral. Um, and I don't think I'm going to give it away, uh, but it is a big part of near the ending of the second book. So uh, I'll just put it that way. It's a, uh, it's a poster that uh, uh, Rasta, which was the telegraph and uh, radio uh, propaganda and telecommunications uh, dur after the revolution, that they did series of uh, posters of how to brush your teeth and how to support the Bolsheviks and how to be part of a new society, a democratic society. Um, and so this was part of that. What else? What else can I... Uh, I'm prepared to answer any and all questions. Um, and... Uh, I'm also prepared to ask you questions. So here's a question for you. <laughs> um, let's see what what might be interesting. Um, there is one quote in here that I got a lot of reaction uh, to, and that is um, when Marina's father believes that she has lost her virginity to, God forbid, uh, Genya Kuryakin, who is a rad the radical poet um, and worker, a working class guy. Uh, she, he sends her into the country. And she, when she's in the country, she says, uh, and if you want to follow along the book, this is page uh, 181, uh, she says she's thinking about how her father uh, sent her off and um, thinking about he sent her away into the country. He sent the bro her little brother, her artistic, sensitive little brother to military school uh, in the middle of World War One. Pretty extreme. Um, and she says. She thinks about Sidioja. She thinks about how the trees themselves miss him uh, at the mother's estate. Um, where is the other one, the big maple asked, but he was gone, lost to the land of men. Why did everyone want a boy to hurry up and become a man, but nobody wanted a girl to become a woman? as if that were the most awful thing that could befall her. So it's, I think that her relationship with her father has been very, has been complicated by uh, her growing up. I've never had a character who was a daddy's girl before. And she is a daddy's girl. She's the apple of, you know, she's the apple of his eye. Um, so what do you think is going on? Why, um, when she confronts him or he confronts her after she's uh, been away with Genya, um, any thoughts about that? Does anybody want a girl to become a woman? Why is that so problematic, especially for fathers? I'm happy to open that one up. You know, I think that he has been so supportive of her. Was anybody surprised that he was so upset when she spent the night? Ah, he's lost control. Did he ever have control of her? Do you think, Valerie? Yeah, he feels that he has lost control of something. That's for sure. Women are stronger than girls. Mm hmm. Do you think that's why he's so upset? Yeah, fathers do think they have control. Daddy never wants girls to grow up because they know how men can be. <laughs> that's, I think that's very true. That's very true. I think, you know, 
it's also there's well why do they want their sons to grow up fast why why is the father so upset that Suryoja is probably gay uh, and definitely artistic and definitely reluctant to be the man yeah her choices differ from what he wants for her what he feels is best for his idea of her that's right yeah because as a woman she's starting to look to look at other men i mean this is where the break comes from right is she's going out with a guy that he doesn't approve of must be scary to compete with new male presence in the daughter's life and he's not going to compete either with this guy you know yelling up at the yelling up at the windows i think of him you know kind of brando he has like a lot of Brando kind of characteristics in my mind when I picture Genya. That's that's one of the pictures I have of him is him yelling up at the windows and reciting his poetry and drives the father crazy. Yeah, I think, and then I think also there's a women, there's a vulnerability that women have and compromises that women have to make or had to make at those at that time. And maybe the father was ambitious for her. So to see her getting involved and being a woman and operating on her sexuality kind of worries him that it's going to limit her. And Joe Beth says he also seems like a control freak in the revolution. Yeah, he is a very, uh, he's a politician and he's, you know, has definite ideas and he is a control freak. Um, he's used to being listened to. He's got a big ego. Um, He's probably hurt she didn't choose someone more like him. That's true. And she thinks, what if I told him that I actually lost my virginity to Kolya? Would he like it better because he's in their class? Is it a class issue? He's absolutely accustomed to giving orders. Um, you know, he's an intellectual and, you know, a jurist, a very bright guy and used to expressing himself in a, uh, you know, in the public arena. You know, he's in politics. Uh, so he is definitely accustomed to giving and accustomed to being listened to and to have this his daughter who always just doted on him to basically saying, what do you want me to do? You know, this is my life. I, I you know, you can threaten me, but I can't, I'm not going to stuff the genie back in the bag. This is my new life. Um, I think it's the first time that Marina is the first time we see her say, this is, this is who I am, you know, her self acceptance, um, which is something that runs throughout the books, uh, is she's somebody who doesn't apologize for being who she is, um, which really, uh, my other character, my other protagonists are usually very um, full of doubt, self-doubt, self-questioning. Uh, this is the most confident person I've ever, um, I've ever written because she she believes that you know her she believes in what she's doing at any moment even if she changes her mind later uh you know she's full of self-confidence and i think that's a daddy's girl thing too well, what else would you like to know or like to talk about let's open this up Do you think that he would have been as upset if she had said, I'd slept with Kolya, not with Genya? Don't be shy. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I have a feeling that he... He would have, uh, it would have been a different situation had he, um, had it been Kolya, you know, 
I think there was a de there's definitely a, uh, a ownership, a class issue, you know, passing your daughter down to um, a man of your own class and station and inviting him into the family and then it, you get married and the, then all the sins are washed away. Um, so here's another question. Um, do you believe that it's possible to love two people? Is she in love with both Genya and Kolya? Yeah, indeed, always a class issue, especially obvious in uh, a time like the revolution. Because it's starting to be questioned. People are much more thinking about these things. You believe it's possible to love two people. So what is she, what's the difference between her and Kolya and her and Genya? Yeah, I would say she is too. Okay, Genya says, uh, uh, Joe Beth says, I'm curious about how easily Genya lets her go in such a dangerous world, and yet she says she is his every, it says she is his everything. He seems shallow for a poet. And then Valerie says, I think she's in love with the poet for what he is more than who he is. That's very subtle and true. Um, she loves them in different ways. Love is very complex. Yeah, I think that, that, um, he is very young, Joe Beth. I think that he's very young and says that he loves her, but, you know, love is, you know, uh, all kinds of people can love people and yet they still are themselves. You know, love doesn't cure the person of their flaws. Uh, as many a young woman finds out, and young man probably too, you know, that the love of somebody can love you intensely, but it doesn't cure them of their all their flaws so that eventually the person they are does come up. I think that I do, I agree with that, that she loves what, Valerie was saying is that I think she's in love with the poet for what he is more than who he is. That as the romantic, she just pictures their life together and is just in love with the whole thing. Um, where in Kolya's case, he's the guy she just can't stay away from. Uh, Kolya is a first love, but Genya is her new identity. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Kolya is the past. Kolya represents her brother and her childhood and, you know, that first white-hot love. Uh, and Genya is the revolution. Genya is a new, new way of being in the world. Um, Genya came along when she needed him. When, yeah. I think she admires Genya. Where she doesn't admire Kolya. She just is crazy about him. So that's tough when you when they argue in the green of in the green um apartment, um, their love nest, and she realizes how different they are, more the you know, morally how different they are. And it's very difficult to be with somebody who you don't respect morally, but you're really hot for. There's a lot of conflict right there. Yeah, Genya represents her independence. But Kolya allows her to be who she is. You know, she doesn't have to live up to Kolya. She feels that like she has to live up to Genya. 
Yeah. Yeah, she admires, uh, Joe Beth says, she admires Genya's poetry and his standing with the other poets. Yeah, she, that's more what she wants to be like. She wants to be like him. She doesn't want to be like Kolya. Um, and poetry is, is a big part of who she wants to be and who she is. Um, and there's that feeling of being understood on a level that Kolya can't understand her um, as an artist. He doesn't, he doesn't care about what she wants to, who she wants to be in the world. He could care less. He just wants to, he, he, he loves the passion of her and who she is is, you know, the daughter of this family that he admires and wants to be part of. Um, but her hopes, her dreams, all that, he absolutely indifferent to that. So what else can we talk about? Um, let's talk about... Um, what it is to, um, oh, uh, let's, we can talk about, oh, what was, oh, good, what was the impetus for Marina winding up in the village slash cult at the end of the book? I understand this was common then. Yes, this is the spoiler, big spoiler, uh, but I'm sure everybody's read it uh, by this time. Uh, what was the impetus for Marina winding up in the cult? Okay, well, there were a lot of cults and communes and interesting experiments in living during the revolution. Um, people were freed from their roles. Uh, people were encouraged to share space. Uh, so to form collectives and communes and uh, cooperatives, uh, in apartments, you would live in a collective apartment, so if you could put together a collective, uh, you had a better chance of getting or keeping an apartment with other people. Um, and I think people were trying different ways of being. I think that it, it's also an expression of the mother. There were a lot of spiritualists before the revolution. Uh, the mother is definitely an anthroposophist, which is the Steiner um, philosophy. It's an offshoot of theosophy, which was also very big at the time. You have, you know, Steiner people were like, uh, Stravinsky was into Steiner, and uh, uh, the painter Nikolai Rurik, um, Uspensky was around, and Gurdjieff. Um, and so this kind of thinking was definitely in the air. And then when the revolution breaks out, you know, why not give it a try? Um, so I think that Vera Borisovna, her mother, has always been a spiritualist. But because she was sort of a society matron, uh, part of an intellectual circle, um, she she was sort of bit in her husband's shadow or at least it was a team and once the marriage was sort of over she was at loose ends and a tr you know there was a place for her for her you know her um occult explorations that she could shed all the responsibilities of the society matron and go head first into her spiritual circles and the fact that they would have a commune um, on one of the islands uh, in the north part of the city, um, that made real sense to me. Uh, you know, they would use her because she was a prominent person, very beautiful, uh, very spiritual, and uh, really out there. That they would, they would see the opportunity of her. She had a lot of connections. She had a place in the country that they could retreat to. So she was a very promising uh, prospect. Uh, let's see what we have here. Um, one of the last, okay. Um, 
Yes, it was very common. So one of uh, Elizabeth says one of the last locations Marina is in when reconnected with her mother and the spiritual group was so different, different energy, different pace. Can I talk about that section? Well, this is very much like, I mean, think about Russia at the time. Think about the Bolshevik party. Think about the way Lenin ran the Bolshevik party, he would change his, I, you know, what his, his justification of what he was doing, depending on the situation. He, he, you either, you were either believed it, you were either pro-Bolshevik or you were out. It was, a, there were aspects of the cult that seemed to me to be a microcosm of what was going on in the country. The whole country was becoming, having their set of rules and having their rituals and their beliefs that were not to be challenged. And so to me that um, Mari, what was going on in, in the cult of Ionia was a little microcosm of what was happening in the country as a whole. Uh, let's see. What different energy, different pace. Yeah, I had really, uh, I'm, anybody who knows me, I'm really interested in cults and communes and, and how they, how people decide to create a new society, which was happening in Russia. You know, the Bolsheviks were creating a new society. So here it is in microcosm, as above, so below. Um, creating a new society, it, it becomes very insular and it's winter too, so they're, very, they're cut off from the rest of the world, and Russia itself is cut off from the rest of the world at the time. There's a big blockade. Um, God forbid Bolshevism spreads, you know, huge blockade. Um, so uh, the energy is different. The You know, she's always trying to figure out, how do I feel about this? Am I going to be part of this? She's also deciding where... You know, she can, it's a safe place to have her baby. Her mo mother's there, but her, not really there, but her nanny's there. Um, is it a safe place? Is it not a safe place? And she's much more connected to nature there. She gets some tools there that she will, that will hold her in good stead uh, in the next book. She really, making the, the, the decision to leave Ionia to leave Marino is a huge it's like the closure of a book in her life she's gone from being somebody's girlfriend their wife their lover their daughter the son you know the um, all of these roles and once she leaves there there are no more roles she has no ties no more roles she is now the building of self that Marina M is about is done. When she, by the time she leaves, she decides, even though her mother is there, even though Avdoki is there, even though she's made friends there, even, you know, she's just realized that they are not dependable people, that you can't be looking to other people to lead you. It's just not, never, it's not going to work and it's a dangerous thing that she actually can rely on herself more. So that's, you know, that's a big break for her, uh, the end of that book. Uh, Marie, here's Jo Beth. Marina's relationship with her mother was fascinating. I like how complicated it got as their household shrunk with a nanny in between the two. Then the winter house scene where she predicted uh, Marina's future. Yeah, so powerful. And, you know, we, here we get into these Russian um, ideas of fate and free will. You know, it's a more fatalistic society. Um, Americans just believe you can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can self-improve up the yin-yang. Um, and Marina believes, does believe in fate, I believe. And fate is character, that you don't change your character. Your fate is your character, and you, and one, the noble thing is to um, 
accept that in a very deep way that you are who you are and that's a noble thing and you bear the suffering that comes with um you know with a a stoic attitude that there's a nobility to that and people have said that's kind of a masochistic streak uh in the russian character um I don't think it's masochistic. I think it's a different way of living in the world uh, and a a um, willingness to not feel like suffering is uh, is a shameful thing, which we do when we're suffering. Americans are suffering. We we like we don't want anybody to know. It's like how's it going? Fine. Fine, you know, God, that is so un-Russian. When I was I was there doing research on this book, I had a fellowship uh, to St. Petersburg, and the woman who worked for the foundation, um, a Russian woman, asked me, "Can you trust Americans?" Well, like, pfft. I mean, there was somebody from the Smithsonian, there was somebody from Symphony Space. It's like. <laughs> Yeah, probably these Americans, <laughs> you could pretty much trust them. And like, Why do you ask? And she said, well, when you ask them how they are, they always say, great, fine. You know, no Russian ever said, fine. Uh, you know, I, and I said, well, you, you know, that's what's considered polite uh, among Americans. And if you want to really know how they are, ask, you have to ask twice. You first, you say, how are you? fine great and then you say how are you really and then they'll tell you yeah well you know actually i'm having some trouble with my kid or whereas a russian it's funny I, I took a lot of russian in high school and college and um i found out they teach you when you uh people say how are you uh they they teach you to say хорошо, good said no russian ever the the <laughs> the the appropriate answer is not bad <laughs> or terrible you know but not bad or normal normal that's as that's as good as it gets so there it's a very different culture and uh, but it's embracing not embracing fate but but accepting fate and not feeling ashamed, sh shameful that bad, if bad things happen, they're not ashamed of it. It's like that life sucks and life is really hard. And if, you know, tough stuff is happening, you tell, you know, you, you're a human being, you're going to talk about it. You're not going to hide that. So let's talk about, okay, Caitlin. Hi. Um, can we speak on all of her romantic relationships in the book and how they reflect on Marina herself? Yeah, let's talk about that. What do you guys think about her romanticism? I mean, I think that she's, um, she's an emotional person rather than, an, she's not really an intellectual. You know, she's uh, she's a uh, she comes from her emotions and she's a very passionate person. So I think that um, she's living in a new world. W girls are not, you know, women are uh, it was as free as it ever got in during the revolution. You could actually get a divorce. You could actually get an abortion, it, you know, um, you know, women's rights, 19 in uh, in 1919, uh, it was the freest country in the world as far as women were concerned. Um, and I think she just sees what she wants and throws herself in. Um, she was not afraid to let go and be passionate, Valerie said. Uh, Joe Beth, I love the passion, the way she tossed the old mores. I think she, I don't know how, you know, people out there see this, but... I think that a lot of women do their exploration and have historically done their exploration of the world through men. They've learned, they learn about the world through men. 
and I think that maybe it doesn't happen as often. Hi, Kathleen. It doesn't happen maybe as often for girls now, but um, I think for a passionate uh, sexual girl like Marina, every man's an adventure. She's, I mean, Ar Arkady calls her an adventurer. And I almost called the book The Adventurous, but it sounded too kind of Regency bodice rippery. But in in uh, the lingo, the Bolshevik lingo of the time, or the leftist lingo of the time, an adventurer was somebody who was in politics, gets involved in the revolution, gets involved in all of this because they have big emotional feelings about the pe about people and they're empathetic and they just want to get involved. And this is a put down, like Varvara would call her an adventurer. That means you're just on the bus for the excitement of it and you not a real Marxist and you, you don't care about the, about the program. Uh, you're not intellectually on the bus, you know, you're, it's all just emotional. So it would it would have had those two meanings, but I figured people would uh, misunderstand if I called <laughs> called her an adventurous. <laughs> um, Caitlin says the time with Arkady killed me. It was both terrifying and entrapping to read. Yes, it was very intense. I um, I I I like an intense book myself. I, I want to have a really big experience. You know, uh, when I read books from a certain era of, uh, a certain era of um, English literature, you know, when somebody, you know, says something in the parlor and one eyebrow goes up, whoop, I mean, to me, that is not enough. You know, I, I am attracted to Russian literature because of the intensity. So when she um, is kidnapped by Arkady, uh, is it a kidnap? Yeah, well, I guess when he locks it, then, then it's a kidnap. When she is imprisoned by uh, Arkady, um, I found him very interesting. Um, you can't write villains... Um, without imagining what it is to be them. What do they want? Who are they? You know, they, they don't see themselves as villains. They see themselves as making perfect sense. And Arkady is a crime boss, and he is a ruthless and pretty crazy guy. Um, everybody's afraid of him. He sees something he wants. Uh, he's a little... He's not, he's an interesting, if you think of the three lovers, if you think of him as one of her lovers, because she was originally the one who sought him out. Um, you know, Kolya, Genya, and Ar Arkady. I mean, Arkady really is sees her, sees the whole thing, you know, in a way that neither Kolya nor Genya can. Um he wants the whole thing, but he wants it under lock and key. So that's not it either. Um, and Natalie, hi, Natalie. Arkady was one of the best villains. <laughs> Thank you. I love my villains. Uh, without a good villain, you don't have the same intense conflict. Um, because also he's very seductive. Um, and... There's some certain men who are very powerful, very seductive, very dangerous, and girls can make a mistake with men like that, thinking that uh, they're going to somehow be safe because they're that guy's attracted to you. So n you've heard how brutal he is, you know how dangerous he is, but he's into me, you know, so I'll be safe. Well, duh. Guess what? No. You know, the love of a bad man is bad news. It, it doesn't redeem. Love re redeems nobody, never. You know, not in my books. <laughs> I put us in the bedroom with her. Yeah, I do. I, I just, 
that's the one thing I, I had this book reviewed by an historian who was a man who was absolutely outraged at how much sex there was in the book. And I'm like, this is a passionate 18 year old girl, 19 year old girl. You know, what do you mean too much sex? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so was there anyone in real life who inspired Arkady? Uh-huh. There was somebody. I mean, he wasn't. He was crazy, but he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't brutal. But there was something so compelling about this guy. It was just like, you know, you could feel the tide pulling you out. It was like, no, no, no. So, yeah, I did use somebody um, that, uh, somebody I dated <laughs> for a while. I was going to follow that guy. That was a... I got a, you know, that was a lucky break, <laughs> the way that turned out. Hey, Susie. Uh, Caitlin, Genya was my favorite character, Caitlin said. Um, Peggy was saying, why would Kolya send her to Arkady? Well, he thought, I think that, Col that Kolya just thought she could to cash in and uh, that would be the end of it. It never occurred to him that she would seek him out and be intrigued by him. You know, he never said, you know, sell the thing and don't get an, you know, and that should be it. Um, I think that he was, no, I think he just thought of it as a marketplace. I, I don't think that he thought that she would be in danger. He didn't think it through. He's sort of impulsive, too. And he has, Kolya has a, a, a wee bit too much self-confidence. Um, that is what gets the foxes caught in the trap, um, is that he he has more self-confidence. What did T.S. Eliot, the book of practical cats, you know, he has a little more confidence, that, too much confidence that a cat really should have. Yeah. Kolya is a little too confident in himself a lot like Marina. And so he thinks everything's going to turn out all right. He always is the optimist. Everything's going to turn out all right. And that's not necessarily true. Um, uh, yeah, I was very lucky to get out of that. He dumped me. It was really upsetting at the time. <laughs> lucky break, huh? Um, Hi, Alicia. Thank you. Um, I'm glad they they mean a lot. I, I've been working on this book for the two books, M Marina and Chimes of Lost Cathedral. That's 12 years of work. And a lot of the work is the research. I, I just, you know, I read hundreds of books. I took a couple of trips to Russia doing research. Um, the one thing I never wanted was an historian or a Russian uh, person to say you got it wrong. I mean, people have objected to say the sex or whatever, but nobody has said I didn't do the research. You know, uh, I, I have not gotten stuff wrong. I've gotten, I've, I have my own opinion about how things evolved and my own opinion about the revolution and about the Bolsheviks, especially in, in P Petersburg and Petrograd. Um, and uh, you'll see more of that in Chimes of Lost Cathedral, which when they come back to, uh, to Petrograd. Um, but nobody's ever said that I didn't do the work. That was that I, I, I was starting, I thought I was going to become an historian before I became a, a, a fiction writer. And so those habits die hard. You know, you want to make sure that it stands up. Well, thank you. So let's see, I have time for uh, one or two more questions. So um, if anybody has something, um, So how about the girls, the three girls, Marina and her two friends, Mina and Varvara? 
Thank you. I, I do my best for accuracy. Um, so it started out as a book about those three girls. I was going to tell it in everybody's point of view. And they're sort of my, this is my brother's Karamazov. So Varvara is, is the, uh, the intellectual, Ivan, um, uh, Marina is the passionate Dimitri, and then Mina, the good girls, the saintly Alyosha. But it's funny, as you go along, they change roles, they change their, um, as they evolve, the relationships change a great deal. Uh, and that was that was really fun. And it's very rare that a reviewer notices that it's a book about three girls. Um, there's something about the fact that it's it's a big historical novel about a serious political subject. They they have trouble reconciling that girls are involved. But very young people became very prominent during the revolution. You know, it wasn't an old person's uh, scene. Um, yeah, Varvara is another, her announcement to Marina's dad, you know, that she is going to be the new generation and we're not respecting you, um, old guy, D Dimitri, uh, you know, step aside because Marina's with us now. Um, I really like Varvara. Natalie says, I've known people like her in political circles. In my mind, my picture of her Susan Sontag, uh, early on. That's how I picture Varvara. I also knew somebody who I also based Varvara on. Um, very uh, brisk, uh, opinionated person. She gave me a lot of work when I was starting off as a journalist. Uh, God love her. Um, but yeah, you know, these relationships are very complex. Girls are not just like, oh my God, let's go to the mall. You know, girls are very complicated and uh, very interesting. And and uh, I, I'm always fascinated by how women evolve into themselves. So Peggy asks, is there any place you would have liked to stray from the historic of the story? No. Mm -mm. Nope. No, I always saw her as a an embodiment of the conflicts of the period. And so the events, um, it's like a skeletal structure. I don't see her apart from the times or the place. I think she is the conflict where she said, you know, there's something that happens in in uh, Chimes of Lost Cathedral, no spoilers, but you know the that she's both from Petrograd, which is the revolutionary city, and from Petersburg, which is the imperial city, the city of culture and literature, and um, a European life. You know, Petrograd is the Russification of Petersburg. So the whole point of Petersburg is that it was part of the West and it had it had a port. It was an ocean going, a seafaring city, which is very rare in Russia. It's a landlocked country for the most part. Uh, so there's a certain certain colors and certain sounds that are very much a part of Petersburg. And then Petrograd is like, it's the revolution, it's the vanguard, it's the most cutting edge part of uh, the radical movements. Uh, it's, you know, the workers coming into their own and, and she's both. So the, she is such a figure of that place and the duality of her is also the duality of that city. I can't wait for my copy of Chimes of the Lost Cathedral. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's uh, it's coming out next week, the 2nd of of uh, July. This already, wow. Yeah, 2nd of July. And uh, there is, what I love about the book is, 
it, I've put in a cast of characters and events so that you can, it's easy to remember what's happened in uh, who everybody is and where we left them and, and stuff like that. It has maps. Uh, it has a map of Civil War Russia. Look at this. They made a map for me. So we see she goes deep into the heart of Russia during the Civil War uh, after she leaves Marino. And then it has, then I've got another map of her, uh, of, of Petrograd, uh, after she, after she returns. So there, Little Brown is a wonderful publisher and has given me these gorgeous maps and uh, cast of characters and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so thank you very much for joining me for the book group and, uh, I'm thinking this was really fun, so I'm thinking in a month or two I might do this for Chimes of Lost Cathedral if people have read it by that time. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, we'll see you. Um, my tour is coming up, so check out my Facebook page. It has the tour, what's coming up. Hope, hope to meet you in person, and uh, wish you good reading. Thank you. Bye.